Hi, my name is Nance, and when I'm not out skateboarding and doing super awesome tricks like the ones you just saw, or cuddled up on my couch with the Jake Gyllenhaal body pillow I ordered off Etsy and listening to Imogen Heap and crying for hours and hours, I'm usually thinking about stuff. Because I'm one of those people who can't stop thinking about stuff. Um, and here at Theory Underground, we've been reading a lot um, of really important texts, books, and essays, and, and having really fucking awesome and fulfilling lectures. Um, and that's awesome because it's it's not easy to access this for most people um, in their daily lives. Their daily lives are just too full of the act of living um, to really get down to the business of really thinking about stuff. Um, and yeah, and it is what it is. And so one thing that Dave's been doing is he's been reading books and doing exegesis on them. Um, I've been greatly benefiting from that. And uh, one of the things he said is he wants other people to start doing it too. And I was like, you know what, dude, fuck it. Why not? Why not? Why not? I try it. I woke up in a bad mood today. Uh, it was weird. I, I had my first dream in French. I'm learning French on Duolingo. Um, and last night I had my first French dream and it was fucking weird. And I was a Milwaukee tools salesman. Um, and I was upset because Makita tools are better than Milwaukee tools in my experience. And I don't know if that's why I was upset, but it was just something that when I woke up this morning, I was like, man, that was fucking weird. It was in French, which is fucking weird. That's the first time that's happened. It was really cool, but it was weird. Um, and then I was like, why am I dreaming about tools? Um, there's like on YouTube shorts, there's like a lot of like tool channels and shit that I scroll through. Like my algorithm is like skateboarding and then like theory and philosophy and then tools. Um, so that's fucking weird. But that's not why I woke up in a bad mood. That was actually amusing. Uh, but anyway, I woke up and I went skateboarding this morning. And I came home um, and I was trying to write. And nothing's really coming out. Um, so I was like, you know what, man? Dave was like, hey, other people should, should do this exegesis shit too. And I was like, you know what, man? Fuck it. I'll give it a shot now. I can't do exegesis. Exegesis is taking uh, content and elucidating it and explaining what it means and, and using the text itself and going through and dissecting it and explaining it. Uh, and then there's this thing called like eisegesis or something, which is like the opposite. It's like taking a text and making it mean whatever you want it to mean. Um, excuse me, and I don't want to do that either <laughs> because I want to understand what, what this stuff means, uh, because I think it, I think it's, I think it's important. I think we're all generally dissatisfied. <laughs> um, and I think this stuff, this theory stuff um is is a way to 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 get through that um i mean that's what has always drawn me to it i mean i, I remember learning for the first time about philosophy and, and wisdom and i had a teacher who was like yeah you know there's knowledge and then there's there's philosophy and, and wisdom love of love of knowledge or love of wisdom sophia wisdom and he's like and, and knowledge is knowing a thing and wisdom is knowing how to take that knowledge of things and apply it to your life to have a happier better more fulfilling life living well and, and the examined life and all that stuff um and i was like oh wait a minute like you mean there's other people who feel this dissatisfied and disgruntled as I do, and they have been trying to do something about it. 
Um, and I've always been drawn to it. And that's cool. And I mean, you know, it is what it is. I'm a fucking moron. So I'm not going to do an exegesis. I am going to read. I'm going to read, reread, um, probably only the first little bit of chapter one of For They Know Not What They Do, because that's the text we're currently working through. Um, so I'm going to, I don't know, I'm just going to fucking see what happens, dude. Fuck it. I might not actually do this. Who knows? But we're going to get going. So here we are. This is Slavoj Zizek. I can't fucking speak. Uh, for they know not what they do. And this is chapter one on the one. So I'm, uh, yeah, dude, fuck it. We're just going to jump right into it. And we're going to see if anything happens, if any magic happens. And I'm very much looking forward to other people doing this. Because I'm sure it'll be higher quality than what I can do. So we're just going to fucking get right into it. Chapter one. Section one, chapter one on the one section one, the burst birth of a master signifier, the non analyzable Slovene. Let us begin with our place of enunci enunciation, Slovenia. What does it mean, psychoanalytically speaking, to be a Slovene? There is only one mention of a Slovene in Freud's entire opus. And that is in a letter to the Trieste psychoanalyst Eduardo Weiss on 28th of May, 1922. However, this one mention is itself more than enough, since it condenses within it a whole series of key questions of psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic theory and practice. From the ambiguity of the superego to the problem of the mother as the bearer of the law, prohibition in Slovene tradition. So it's worth taking a closer look at it. Um, yeah, I don't think I have anything to add to that. Vice, who practiced psychoanalysis in the 20s, he emigrated to America in the 30s when political conditions in Italy made his practice impossible. Corresponded regularly with Freud. Their correspondence resolved mainly on Vice's cases. Weiss reported to Freud on the course of analysis and asked him for his advice. So he appealed for Freud's view on two patent, patent patients geez, at the beginning of the 20s, who both suffered from the same symptom, impotence. Let us look at Weiss's own presentation of the two cases. Is it Weiss or Weiss? Whatever, dude. <sighs> okay. <laughs> I'm a stuffy fucking psychoanalyst and I'm writing a letter to Sigmund Freud and is secretly what you didn't know is that this is all code language and Eduardo Weiss was just trying to score coke all of this shit is fake made up code no that's not true okay I have been treating two patients in 1922 who both suffer from impotence the first is a highly cultured man around 40 years old, so some 10 years older than I. His wife, whom he loved very much, had died a few years earlier. He experienced full sexual vigor during the time of the marriage. The wife fell into a heavy depression. Attempts to cure her by some Viennese analysts produced no results at all. She committed suicide. My patient reacted to the suicide with heavy melancholy. Finish. The second patient, a Slovene, was a young man. He had served in the army in the First World War and had only shortly prior to this been demobilized. In the sexual field, he was completely impotent. A number of people had fallen prey to his deception and he had a thoroughly immoral ego. Um, yeah, so there's two guys. One guy's a well-to-do gentleman. He's put together. He does all the right things. He, he has all the right habits. He has a job and money and he pays his bills on time. And then this other guy sounds like a tramp. Or at least that's what's coming through. So um, I'm going to go off on a tangent. My wife died 10 years ago. Um, 
and we had a rich, rewarding sex life. And after she died, I became like a caricature of just like the worst characters in, you know, the popular imagination. I was drinking, doing drugs, and just in general, uh, very publicly failing to be a human. Um, and I slutted myself around for a while. Um, and I also struggled with impotence. Now, I don't know if it was all the drugs or what. And I don't know if uh, it matters. Um, but he's very clearly here making a distinction between this well-to-do gentleman and this trash raccoon Slavine man. What strikes the eye in this presentation is the almost total symmetry of the two cases. The first patient is 10 years older than Vice, the second some 10 years younger. The first is a highly cultured and moral man, the second extremely immoral, and in both cases we are dealing with the same effect, impotence. Strictly speaking, the symmetry is not complete. The Italian was cap capable of occasional sexual contact with prostitutes to a man of high culture and mores. This does not, of course, count as real sexual contact. And yeah, that's... So we all, not all of us, in general, people fuck. Um, actually, it's crazy. Think about your grandparents. Or your grandparents fuck. Your grandparents fucked to make your parents who then fucked to make you um just can you picture your grandparents like doing the freakiest shit you've ever done like if you've ever done freaky shit which you know some people haven't some people have it is what it is excuse me just try to picture your grandparents you know what i'm saying going fucking going ham um I mean, you could think of it as gross, or you could also use that as a tool to help you realize, you know, we're all silly, foolish, disgusting creatures. Um, and it's beautiful. But people fuck in general. And some people are totally okay with the fact that, yeah, I fuck. And I, I, I think that's, I think that's normal. I think that's healthy to just be like, yeah, man, I fuck, you know, it is what it is. Um, but then there are people who, who like to pretend they don't fuck. And that's what he's talking about. He's talking about like, you know, the holier than thou high and mighty people that are like, oh, how dare you? I would never, you know get my fucking rocks off or whatever because ooh, how uncouth to be a human who fucks another human because you know whatever it is kind of gross when you actually sit back and think about it like damn you know but at the same time like eating is gross you're just eating poop ingredients like that's fucking gross too um but yeah so this guy's a, a well to do well put together gentlemen so oh no of course i'm not actually having real sex this is this is nothing more than masturbation i'm using these prostitutes as a tool to achieve the uh goal of expressing myself to let off some steam but that's not real sex because what is real sex well i mean what is real sex is real sex making love when you have a, a genuine emotional human connection with another person or is real sex just getting off? I don't know. This does not, of course, count as real sexual contact. Contact with an equal, while the Slovene was completely impotent. Com co contact with an equal, right. 
No, that prostitute's not a human. That prostitute is a fleshlight with hair. And then the Slovene is just a fucking trash raccoon. Freud's answer in the letter of May 28, 1922, took up this duality. He opined that the Italian warranted further treatment, since one was dealing with a man of high culture and mores. In his case, it was simply exaggerated remorse. His impotence was a result of a pathological guilt complex. The solution for him, a man, <clears throat> a man of refined sensitivity, was acceptance of his wife's suicide. About the Slovene, Freud remarked, the second one, the Slovene, is obviously a good-for-nothing who does not warrant your efforts. Our analytical art fails when faced with such people. Our perspicarity alone cannot break through to the dynamic relation which controls perspicacity alone cannot break through to the dynamic relation which controls them. Okay. The second one, the Slovene, is obviously a good-for-nothing who does not warrant your efforts. Our analytical art fails when faced with such people. Our perspicacity alone cannot break through to the dynamic relation which controls that perspicacity. Hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm a, I'm a do the thing real quick, so... You guys probably know what this word means. And I I fucking I know I've used it before too. I just what the fuck does it mean? I don't know what it means right now. The quality of having a ready insight into things, shrewdness. So our our perspicacity, so our excellence, our mastery, our expertise cannot break through to the dynamic relation which controls them. So they're just trash pandas or trash raccoons, whatever the fuck. What's that shit? Whatever. They're trash. They're not humans. They're not worth your time. That's striking. That. I mean, he's just coming out and saying it like, yeah, those people aren't worth it. It, it kind of rhymes with the. Uh, the underclass ideology that. Uh, oh, you know, those those poor ethnics living in the ghetto um we just need to break them up and spread them out um because when you get that many people of that low quality together you're bound to have problems that's fucking crazy that is actually crazy that that freud just like straight up was like yeah fuck those guys they're trash now, is it specifically because the guy is a Slovene, or is it specifically because uh, he's just a trashy slut? I don't know. I could, I mean, I could try to read into it and be like, oh yeah, Freud was was uh, racist. Uh, I mean, I'm sure he was. But I don't know. I don't fucking have any idea. So whatever, dude. It is not difficult to detect a basic deadlock in Freud's answer. It shows primarily in the contradictory nature of it his oscillation between two positions. His first presents the Slovene as somebody, someone unworthy of psychoanalytic care, with the implication that it is a simple case of direct, superficial, evil immorality without any kind of depth that pertains to our unconscious psychic dynamic. Then, in the following sentence, his case is contrarily defined as such that it cannot be analyzed. The barrier here is thus not ethical, unworthy of analysis, but of an epistemological manner, nature. It is in itself non-analyzable. An analytic attempt at it fails. So it's not that this guy is trash and, and beneath them. It's that this guy is other. This guy is not what we are and so we can't use the tools we use on us on him because he's other so it actually does sound like it is a like an essentialist argument rather than just a you know fuck that guy argument the paradox with which we are dealing here corresponds precisely to the logical paradox of the prohibition of incest. 
What is prohibited is something already in itself impossible, and the enigmatic character of the prohibition of incest is precisely in this redundancy. If something is in itself impossible, why is it necessar necessary further to forbid it? Right. So, no, I'm not even going to try. I have thoughts on that, but I'm going to keep them to myself for now. Which is funny because this is an exercise in not keeping things to myself. That's funny. Wherein consists, then, the paradox of the Slavine's impotence? Nothing is easier than to explain this impotence as a result of excessive obedience, remorse, as a result of a feeling of guilt resulting from excessive discipline and rigid moral sensitivity and so on. This is the habitual, everyday concept of psychoanalysis against the excessive discipline of superego, this agency of internalized social repression. It is necessary to reaffirm, reaffirm the subject's capacity for relaxed fruition. It is necessary for the subject to free the internal inhibition which blocks his access to enjoyment. Wherein consists, then, the paradox of the Slavine's impotence? Nothing is easier than to explain this impotence as a result of excessive obedience, remorse, as a result of a feeling of guilt resulting from excessive discipline and rigid moral sensitivity, and so on. This is the habitual, everyday concept of psychoanalysis against the excessive discipline of superego, this agency of internalized social repression. It is necessary to reaffirm the subject's capacity for relaxed fruition. It is necessary for the subject to free the internal inhibition, which blocks his access to enjoyment. Okay. Freud's Slovene exhibits clearly the insufficiency of such a logic of freeing desire from the restraint of internal repression. He is, in Vice's words, very immoral. He exploits his neighbors and is seized with no kind of moral scruple. Yet in all this, he is far from able to achieve relaxed fruition in sex. Without any kind of internal obstruction, he is completely impotent. Enjoyment is entirely forbidden to him. Or in the words of Lacan against Dostoevsky, against his famous position, if there is no God, all is permitted. If there is no God, the name of the Father is an instance of the law, prohibition, everything is forbidden. And it is too much to suggest that this is precisely the logic of totalitarian political discourse. Is it, and is it too much to suggest that this is precisely the logic of totalitarian political discourse? The impediment of the subject produced by his, this discourse results from a similar absence, suspicion, suspension of the law of prohibition. However, to return to our Slovene on the basis of the fact that it was only when Lacan that it was only Lacan who elaborated this logical paradox of impediment of universalized prohibition brought about by the very absence of the law of prohibition. We could venture some wild speculation and say that we Slovenes, unanalyzable according to Freud, had to wait for Lacan to find a meeting with psychoanalysis. Only with Lacan did psychoanalysis itself achieve a level of sophistication on which it is capable of tackling such foul apparitions as the Slovenes. Yeah. I mean, there's, again, a lot there, but I don't think I want to hazard an attempt at unpacking it because, yeah, because I don't want to. How do we account for this paradox that the absence of law universalizes prohibition? There's only one possible explanation, enjoyment itself which we experience as transgression is in its innermost status something imposed, ordered. When we enjoy, we never do it spontaneously. We always follow a certain injunction. 
the psychoanalytic name for this obscene injunction or this obscene call. Enjoy! Is superego. This paradox of the superego is staged in its pure form in Monty Python's Meaning of Life. In the episode about sexual education, bored schoolboys yawn in the classroom awaiting their teacher's arrival when one of them shouts, He is coming! All of a sudden, they start to make a noise, shout, and throw things at each other. The entire spectacle of wild uproar is here exclusively to impress the teacher's gaze. So the schoolboys were just sitting quietly, patiently, waiting. And once they knew that their authority figure was on the way, then, then they became uproarious and obstreperous. Then they decided now is the time to put on display because this is a game that we're playing. And now is the time for us to do the thing. Before, they weren't doing the thing because there was no need. There was no reason for them to do the thing. It was not expected of them to do the thing. And then once that teacher arrives, it becomes time for them to do the thing so the teacher can do his thing of being the teacher, being the authority figure, being the discipline and reigning in control. So it's a game and we're all playing it. And we're trying to find a way out, an exit of that game, an exit to the game. impress the teacher's gaze after quiet quietening them the teacher begins to examine them on how to arouse to examine them on how to arouse the vagina caught in their ignorance the embarrassed pupils avoid his gaze and stammer half articulated answers while the teacher reprimands them severely for not practicing the subject at home so to me that's that's kind of like just absurdism it's it's like hey the boys are sitting quietly patiently you know just being just being there and then when the teacher arrives then then it's time for them to do the thing so the teacher can do the thing discipline and, and structure and order um and that's one part and that's just kind of pointing out like, hey, these are games that we play. And, you know, maybe maybe you don't have to play the game always. Or maybe you don't have to play it the same way as you have always played it in the past. Or maybe you don't have to do the thing that you think you're supposed to do because it's just a game. So that's part one. Part two of that is just absurdism. Like having schoolboys practice stimulating the vagina at home that's absurd and that's funny and and it it kind of you know calls bullshit on it and it's funny also too funny funniness is good it's good to laugh or whatever While the teacher reprimands him severely for not practicing the subject at home, with his wife's assistance, he thereupon demonstrates to them the penetration of penis into vagina. <sighs> Bored by the subject, one of the schoolboys casts a furtive glance through the window. The teacher asks him, asks him sarcastically, Would you be kind enough to tell us what is so attractive out there in the courtyard? Things are here brought to extreme. The reason this inverted presentation of the normal everyday relationship between law, authority, and pleasure produces such an uncanny effect is, of course, that it exhibits in broad daylight the usually concealed truth about the normal state of things, where enjoyment is sustained by a severe superego imperative. <laughs> yeah, that's what it means. Those words are what it means. crucial theoretical point not to be missed here is that such mirror inversion cannot be reduced to the domain of the imaginary. That is to say, when one deals with the opposition of the imaginary 
captivation by the mirror image, recognition in a fellow creature, and the symbolic, the purely formal order of differential features, one usually fails to notice how the specific dimension of the symbolic emerges from the very imaginary mirroring, namely, from its doubling by means of which, as Lacan uh, put it succinctly, the real image is substituted by a virtual one. The imaginary and the symbolic are therefore not simply opposed as two external entities or levels. Within the imaginary itself, there is always a point of double reflection at which the imaginary is, so to speak, hooked on the symbolic. God, I wish, I fucking wish I could... Like, find a way to say what I'm thinking. Because, like, right here would be, like, a great opportunity for an example, right? Um, and I think I get a feeling of, of an example. But then, like, finding a way to, like, put it into words is difficult. So... Fuck it, we'll read that paragraph again because I can't add anything to it. So <laughs> we'll double it. The crucial theoretical point not to be missed here is that such mirror inversion cannot be reduced to the domain of the imaginary. That is to say, when one deals with the oppositions with the opposition of the imaginary captivation by the mirror image, recognition in a fellow creature and the symbolic, the purely formal order of differential features, one usually fails to notice how the specific dimension of the symbolic emerges from the very imaginary mirroring, namely, from its doubling, by means of which, as Lacan puts it succinctly, the real image is substituted by a virtual one. The imaginary and the symbolic are therefore not simply opposed as two external entities or levels within the imaginary itself, there is always a point of double reflection at which the imaginary is, so to speak, hooked on the symbolic. Yeah, Hegel demonstrates the mechanism of this passage in the dialectic of the topsy-turvy world, not saying German, which concludes the section on consciousness and his phenomenology of spirit. After exposing the Christian notion of the beyond as the inversion of terrestrial life here, injustice and violence reign, while there, goodness will be rewarded, etc. He points out how inversion is always double, how on a closer look it becomes manifest that the first world, whose inverted, inverted image is the topsy-turvy world, is already in itself inverted. Therein consists the rationale of caricature. Let us just recall Swift's procedure in Gulliver's Travels. The reader is confronted with a series of mocking inversions of our normal human universe, the island populated by dwarfs two inches tall, a county, country where normal relations between humans and horses are reversed, where humans live in stables and serve horses. Swift's true targets are, of course, our own weaknesses and stupidities by means of a fantasy world which presents its inverted image. He endeavors to turn into ridicule the, the follies, the invertedness of our own allegedly normal world. The image of humans who serve horses should arouse us to the vanity of the human species as compared with the simple dignity of horses. The null disputes of the Lilliputians are there to remind us of the conceit of human customs and so on. I'm going to reread that starting with fuck it we'll do the whole thing hegel demonstrates the mechanism of this passage and the dialectic of the topsy-turvy world which concludes the section on consciousness and phenomenology of spirit after exposing the christian notion of the beyond as the inversion of the terrestrial life here in justice and violence reign while their goodness will be rewarded etc he points out how inversion is always double, how on a closer look, it becomes manifest that the first world whose inverted image is the topsy-turvy world is already in itself inverted. 
Therein consists the rationale of caricature. Let us just recall Swift's the procedure, Swift's procedure in Gulliver's Travels. The reader is confronted with a series of mocking inversions of our normal human universe. The island is populated by dwarfs two inches tall. A country where normal relations between human and horses, humans and horses are reversed, where humans live in stables and serve horses. Swift's true targets are, of course, our own weakness and stupidities by means of a fantasy world which presents its inverted image. He endeavors to turn into ridicule the follies, the invertedness, of our own allegedly normal world. The image of humans who serve horses should arouse us to the vanity of the human species as compared with the simple dignity of horses. The null disputes, the null disputes of the Lilliputians are there to remind us of the conceit of human customs and so on. So for me, that's, and I'm wrong. I'm already telling you I'm wrong. So don't hold it against me. To me, um, that's him using that absurdism to demonstrate like the absurdity of you know what the fuck is actually going on um that's how i take it and that's how i feel about it um and now the the thing is 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 yeah obviously like he said that first it's the second part that's being said that i'm not getting um, but like, uh, like the fountain, like the, the toilet, the upside down urinal, the inverted urinal, um, that was like, Hey, this is, this is art. And there's a bunch of like drama and shit surrounding the fountain, whatever. I don't give a shit. Um, but he was like submitting this inverted urinal to the art fucking museum or whatever to demonstrate the absurdity of like art um god damn it i can't fucking think right now but you guys know what i'm saying and more importantly you know what our man fucking slavoj zizek is saying that's more important. Fuck me. Fuck what I'm saying. It's about what our favorite perverted Slovene is saying. Here we can clearly discern the function of the ego ideal. That is of symbolic identification from its, from its imaginary counterpart. Symbolic identification is identification with the ideal virtual point from which... The subject looks, looks upon himself when his own actual life appears to him as a vain and repulsive spectacle. That is to say, Swift, like Monty Python, belongs to the misanthropic lineage of humor based on an aversion to life as the substance of enjoyment. And the ego ideal is precisely the viewpoint assumed by the object when he perceives his very normal everyday life as something inverted. This point is virtual since it figures nowhere in reality it differs from actual life as well as from its inverted caricature that is to say it cannot be located within the mirror relationship between reality and its inverted image as such it is of a strictly symbolic nature Here, we can clearly discern the function of the ego ideal, that is, of symbolic identification. From its imaginary counterpart, symbolic identification is identification with the ideal, virtual point from which the subject looks upon himself when his own actual life appears to him as a vain and repulsive spectacle. I wish I was smarter. Symbolic identification is identification with the ideal point from which the subject looks upon himself when his own actual life appears to him as a vain and repulsive 
spectacle. Yeah, dude, I fucking wish I was smart. I'm actually gonna... I'm gonna stop now, because this was an experiment. And... I mean, I know it's trash, but I think I'm gonna go ahead and commit to posting it on the forum anyway. Um, because maybe I can do it again and again and again and again and again. And maybe at some point in the endless repetition, it will prove valuable. And also maybe a lot of other people will We'll do it too, and then I can watch other people do what I would like to be able to do, and maybe that'll fucking be cool or something. Um, I don't know. If you made it to this part, fucking congratulations, and I apologize, and I thank you, and... Please, if you made it this far, please give me some fucking constructive criticism. Please. That would be very much appreciated. So anyway, I'm going to try to go do something else. Try to be productive. And uh, yeah, I'll fucking see you when I see you. Catch you on the flip side. Fucking Wu-Tang. Peace.